All right, so thanks again for joining us. I am Mirta Trova, sales engineer at ASI. ASI is based in Amsterdam and produces hybrid pixel detectors based on Medipix and TimePix technology developed by CERN. Scientists have benefited from this technology in many fields and applications like microAD, for the STEM, EELS, and many others that you are very welcome to check out on our website. As mentioned before, if you have any questions during the seminar, feel free to write them down in the chat and one of our moderators will either pick it up or we will address it at the end. I'm very happy to introduce our guest speaker, once again, Professor Jonas Weissenreder. He obtained his PhD in material physics at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology. He started his career at the synchrotron facility MaxLab as a beamline manager. He then continued his research in different institutes until he returned to KTH, where he's now serving as a full professor. His main research focuses on ultrafast electron microscopy, and we're very excited to have him here today to learn more about his experience creating a UEM setup that facilitates microscopic imaging, diffraction, and spectroscopy at picosecond timescales. Jonas, the platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, Mirtu, and thank you for uh, letting me show some of my results. Uh, so I will start by sharing the screen. Uh, so today I will talk about ultrafast electron microscopy and uh, with a special emphasis on structural and magnetization uh, dynamics. I will start by talking about some magnetization dynamics that we have recently uh, obtained and then continue in the end with the structural dynamics of uh, uh, a system, a transition that dicalcionide system. So I'll just briefly an introduction to the instrument. Uh, this is a schematic drawing of a uh, ultrafast electron microscope. So the microscope is retrofitted with two optical viewport or viewports that can allow access, optical access to the sample positioned here and also to the cathode. And the laser beam that we guide to the cathode is used for um, generating electron bunches that are then accelerated through the column and uh, through the sample and then recorded uh, subsequently on a detector of some kind. For instance, now this uh, Amsterdam scientific detector that I will uh, show results from today. So. Uh, this is uh, the view of our instrument in the lab. Uh, it was uh, retrofitted together with ISM, IDS. Uh, and here you see in a blue, as a blue line, the optical beam path of uh, the UV pulse, laser pulse that we use for uh, exciting the cathode. And our laser, uh, tangerine laser, is positioned over here. Uh, and uh, we take out two beams then, first the UV beam that we guide to the cathode and then through this uh, another beam that could either be a 1030 nanometer or 550 nanometer that we guide through the sample position that is here in the real instrument. So this is a uh, cross section of the instrument where we have the cameras here and below the retractable cameras we also have a uh, uh, GIF, uh, um, an EADS detector. So the camera that uh, was used for collection of uh, most of the data that we present today is uh, a Medipix based uh, uh, Sheta camera from, uh, from Amsterdam Scientific. And uh, the main uh, advantage of this camera in the application uh, of ultrafast electron microscopy is that it has a very low noise. So, uh, so we can integrate for a very long time and still Will not get integrated noise. So this is uh, some data taken in uh, by Mauro Gemmi where he has compared uh, diffraction patterns under identical conditions for uh, with the CCD camera and with the Medipix camera. And as you can see in these line profiles here to the right, you have a much higher signal to noise in uh, this hybrid detector. 
So this detector works such that you can set uh, different thresholds for uh, that where you will accept the count or not. So for instance, if you set a low threshold, you will uh, like what's indicated here by threshold one, you will get three counts. But if you increase the threshold, you can uh, only accept one count. And it can operate in both sequential read-write uh, read mode or continuous read-write mode. So in uh, our detector, in our instrument, we don't use any timing capabilities of the detector because uh, our time resolution that we aim for is much higher. So instead, we uh, use uh, the time structure of the electron bunch and the laser to um, uh, deliver the uh, time resolution. So and this is done in what is called a pump probe scheme. So we excite the, uh, the sample that we're interested in by a laser pump. And this uh, laser pump serves as a time zero or clocking pulse for uh, our experiment. And then we uh, adjust the uh, arrival of the electron probe pulse with respect to this uh, laser pump pulse that is our time zero. And uh, we uh, sit at some certain delay time and integrate the diffraction pattern over several cycles. So this means that this method that I'm showing here can only work for uh, uh, reversible systems meaning that the system must relax after photo excitation back to its uh, original state before we excite it again. So that it's set uh, an over, uh, like an upper limit for what repetition rate we can use in the system. So we can determine uh, time resolution, for instance, through uh, using our yields detector by collecting uh, information from a mechanism that is called photoelectron, uh, uh, photoinduced, photoinduced near field uh, microscopy. And uh, this is uh, a measurement that is done by exciting uh, a material, for instance, a uh, uh, silver nanowire and uh, looking at the sidebands uh, associated with the interaction of uh, the electron bunch when it passes through or near the uh, nanowire that it will absorb uh, energy or emit energy with the same uh, photon at the same wavelength as the photon energy that we pump the system with so you can see here at the position of time zero um, we will get sidebands on the um, uh, relative to the uh, zero loss peak in the electron loss spectrum and uh, this effect is pretty uh, pretty uh, uh, dies off pretty rapidly so uh, we can use it to determine roughly the time resolution of the system but now i will more discuss uh, the magnetization dynamics that we have probed in this uh, in uh, in these measurements, and we have looked at uh, a permalloy sample that we have excited with a transient optical grating. Um, so, um, and uh, we have studied the system with a method called Lorentz imaging. So, in Lorentz imaging, we use a parallel uh, electron B and then look at the beam tilts inflicted by the magnet local magnetization of the sample at the relative relative position for instance if we would look at such a domain structure where we have four different domains with the magnetization in the plane and the domain walls here if we um, uh, look in Lorentz mode with a parallel beam uh, and image uh, our sample in overfocus or underfocus, the uh, domain walls can appear as either bright or dark contrast regions. So, um, um, so this is the method that we use for studying. Um, this um, uh, system as we excited instead of using a homogeneous pump uh, pulse we use a transient optical grating so the transient optical grating is basically uh, manufactured such that we uh, divide our pump beam into two beams by placing a mirror close to the sample 
And this mirror will then, uh, the sample will then be illuminated by a direct laser beam and also by a reflected laser beam. And the interference pattern formed by the direct and, laser and, uh, and the reflected laser beams will generate an fringes on, uh, on the um, uh, sample surface as shown here in the image, schematic image. So this will generate a, uh, a periodic excitation uh, in this uh, direction, where the periodicity of this can direction can be determined by the tilting angle of uh, the, this mirror. And uh, we can see that you can accur accurately predict this uh, periodicity here between the lattice, between the fringes uh, from just uh, conventional uh, geometry. So when we look at this experiment, immediately after time zero, we see uh, the formation of stripe magnetic contrast. But, and this magnetic contrast will uh, reverse its sign when we go from over-focus to under-focus and the periodicity of the magnetic contrast will double as we go from green light 550 nanometers to red light 1030 nanometers. So if we study uh, the intensity of the uh, uh, magnetic structure, the striped magnetic structure, we can, uh, we can study it in two different ex experimental geometries. One is uh, where we, if we, I define a, 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 a coordinate system such as this, is that we have we can by exciting the objective lens we can generate uh, an out of plane uh, magnetization uh, uh, magnetic field, and if we tilt the sample ar around this alpha axis, that will generate a component inside uh, or in the plane of the sample. So if we uh, study the dynamics of the material of the on permalloy. Uh, in the in-plane uh, magnetic component line along this y direction here that is perpendicular to the lattice fringes of the optical grating. Then we, we, we can observe oscillation in the magnetization intensity as a function of time. And if we take a line profile, like uh, for instance at this position indicated by the yellow line here, and follow one position on the line profile, we will see that the magnetization contrast uh, changes sign as a, from a negative to positive to negative to positive at every second uh, maxima that we observe here in the total image contrast. However, if we align the uh, external magnetic field, the in-plane component of the external magnetic field along the transient magnetic, uh, grating or the optical uh, grating as well uh, by tilting along, along this beta axis. We don't see this oscillation in intensity instead, but we see the formation, uh, uh, immediate formation of uh, the magnetic contrast and that this contrast perhaps rise a little bit in intensity until uh, uh, this position where it starts to decay again. So we can formulate uh, um, a mechanism for what's happening here. So, we, so when before time zero, the sample is in a state where uh, we have it, it's subject to an external magnetic field indicated here, and the magnetization direction in in the sample is aligned against uh, along. Uh, a metastable uh, or a stable in this case magnetization direction that is indicated with a dotted line here. But immediately after photo excitation with the laser pulse, we will get a rapid demagnetization of the sample and a shift of the uh, metastable uh, magnet uh, magnetization direction, like what's indicated in this image. 
But the uh, magnetic moments, they will not immediately go to this direction, but instead they will process around this new metastable magnetization moment and then slowly being damped out uh, and reach the metastable magnetization direction after several nanoseconds. So through taking uh, into account the experimental parameters of our system, we can uh, determine the local temperature at the sample uh, as a function of laser fluence applied onto the sample. And this local temperature can then uh, be correlated to the saturation magnetization uh, at a certain temperature and also to the precession uh, angle, uh, this initial precession angle. And we can put that in, on a scale, on a one-dimensional scale, perpendicular to uh, the transient optical grating. Uh, and we can see that we will then will form a periodic fluence uh, th through the application of this diffraction pattern, or optical diffraction pattern over the, over the uh, uh, or interference pattern over the surface. And that will then result in a different temp local temperatures at different positions on the sample. And that will also result in different magnet local magnetization and uh, lo different local precession angles. So if we look in a picture where we have the in-plane magnetization moment aligned uh, along the y direction or perpendicular to x, so this is this direction here, uh, then immediately before time zero we will have zero magnetic contrast because all the magnetic moments will be aligned. So there is no uh, transfer of uh, electrons from one region of the detector to another by the magnetization in, in the sample, but all transfer is equal. Then at uh, pi half precession, if we start this coherent precession of uh, uh, the transient magnetic grating, and when this uh, coherent precession reaches phase pi half, then we will have a positive contrast, magnetization contrast here, as indicated by the green dotted lines here. While when we continue in time, the uh, two three pi half phase, we will have a negative contrast. So this means uh, that we will have an oscillation in uh, in uh, in the magnetization contrast here. But if we instead align our external magnetic field so that the in-plane component is parallel to uh, the fringes of the interference pattern will have much less dramatic effects in the time domain. So we will immediately get uh, a demagnetization that will result in, um, in, in magnetic contrast. And this fluctuation over time with precession will only result in minor changes in the magnetic contrast where the maximum magnetic contrast will be uh, viewed at, uh, at a phase pi. So if I draw a cartoon where I try to explain this process in a bit further detail. Um, uh, yeah, so if this uh, field here, up here, uh, represents the position where we have the magnetic field of the, the implant component of the magnetic field aligned along this direction. So before time zero, all the magnetic moments will be aligned in this direction. Then at the time zero, uh, the uh, uh, patent laser pulse arrives at the sample, and this will lead to local de de con uh, <coughs> constructive interference here indicated by the red regions. So we'll get the local demagnetization at this position that is higher than the local demagnetization at the regions where we have deconstructive interference. Uh, but still, this is at a point in time where this uh, precession of the magnetic moment has yet to start. So we will not have any Lorentz contrast. And this is the simulated Lorentz contrast for a magnetization configuration like this. And this is the experimental results. 
Then if we'll wait for a while until the processing magnetic moment had reached phase pi half, uh, then the, um, you, in the cartoon, of course, this cartoon uh, only contains very few magnetic moments. In real life, you have a lot more, but it uh, will be difficult to, to, uh, to have all in a figure. Uh, so this is a simplification of the system, of course. But the simulated um, Lorentz contrast is shown uh, for this configuration, I mean, is shown in this image here, where you have also the dotted line uh, represents the uh, intensity along a line profile. And this is the experimental uh, uh, results from uh, taken at the same um, pi half phase. And uh, the scale bar here represents 250 nanometers. Then at phase pi, all the magnetic moments are again aligned with each other and we have almost no Lorentz contrast here. And that is also what we observe experimentally. And then at uh, pay, phase three pi half, we have the reversal of the Lorentz contrast that we can also see in the experimental data where we have dark regions here and bright regions here. However, in the case of um, uh, alignment of the in-plane magnetization along the, uh, uh, the X direction that is along the transient optical grating and the precession magnetic grating, uh, we will immediately get, uh, even after, directly after time zero, we will get uh, a uh, magnetic contrast that is due to uh, uh, the gradient in magnetization that we have between the um, areas of this deconstructive and constructive interference. So, and the, the contrast will increase until uh, uh, this position when pi, when afterwards it will, re will go, uh, go down a little bit in intensity. So if we run some simulations on the thermal diffusion of this system, so this is um, uh, simulations of thermal diffusion as a function of time over one period of the transient optical grating with the constructive interference being in the middle. We can, s and uh, then these uh, lines here are traces taken here and here, which is at the, the deconstructive and constructive interference. Uh, we can see that uh, the thermal gradient persists for more than a few uh, nanoseconds. So this is uh, relevant to the decay factor for uh, this, uh, this effect, since when uh, the sample has thermalized, we expect uh, that we will not get any um, <clears throat> any magnetic contrast anymore. Also to uh, demonstrate uh, that this is indeed a magnetic effect that we're observing in, in addition to uh, just changing uh, the uh, under and over focus of the material and that it fits the data, we can also change the magnetic field, the external magnetic field that we apply on the sample to uh, and, and then look at the precession frequency as a function of the external magnetic field. So these red dots here are um, uh, uh, are experimental data points collected at different external magnetic fields. And uh, in this case, it's the uh, uh, in-plane uh, component of the magnetic field. Uh, and uh, then uh, this is uh, the black dotted line is the FMR <coughs> uh, um, uh, frequency simulated with no exchange coupling considered. And we can see this underestimates the experimental data a little bit. So we had to include uh, uh, exchange coupling uh, with an ex exchange field around 15 millitesla to get an accurate fit of the uh, frequencies. 
now I have presented uh, situations where the uh, ex um, the applied uh, external uh, magnetic field, the in-plane component of that applied external magnetic field, were either perfectly aligned with the y-axis or with the x-axis in our coordinate system. That means either aligned w uh, with the fringes or perpendicular to the fringes of the exciting transient optical grating. However, if we... Uh, uh, tilt the uh, magnetic field a little bit by tilting the sample um, or rotating the sample, uh, then we can uh, generate uh, a magnetic in-plane component that is at an angle with respect to the transient optical grating. And that would uh, then, uh, you. this is the symmetrical situation where you have uh, um, the in-plane component exactly parallel to the y-axis, while if we tilt it by an angle theta, you expect that the precession will be unsymmetrical around uh, the y-axis. And this will give uh, 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 different uh, intensities when you're in uh, Lorentz intensities when you're in a position in, in phase of pi half or three pi half, and that would then you would expect uh, a not a symmetric situation like this situation where you have a steady decrease in the uh, amplitude of the oscillations, but instead you would expect that every second uh, maximum that you observe in the oscillation will be larger and uh, than the other. Um, so in the symmetric situation where we are very closely aligned with uh, the y-axis, we see a steady decline in intensity or decrease in intensity. And this can be modeled by uh, two, uh, including two different effects. One, uh, the black curve here uh, includes only thermal diffusion, while the red also include uh, Gilbert damping. So the red uh, curve is a slightly better fit to the data, but uh, we can see that the thermal uh, da uh, thermal diffusion uh, dominates uh, the damping of the Lorentz contrast. And this is a situation where we have changed the angle a little bit, this gamma angle that I just discussed, so that we get this oscillation in intensity so that every second uh, maxima is larger than uh, uh, the other maxima, which is then reflected in, uh, in this, uh, the magnitude of the X component of the magnetiz local magnetization. So if you uh, tilt, uh, if you increase the gamma angle, so that uh, it matches or uh, get very close to the precession angle of the system, then you expect uh, that this component uh, will vanish completely because it doesn't have any X component in the, in the, the uh, um, when it processes. Okay, this uh, transient processing grating, we can also use this to detect spin wave propagation. So this is an example of an experimental result where we see spin waves, and th these are the different phases of the spin waves. As it propagates over the surface from this direction to here, um, and the spin wave is uh, complicated to uh, image with uh, a conventional ultra-fast electron microscope or even a conventional microscope, of course, uh, because the spin wave has quite long wavelengths. It's in the order of several microns. So the Lorentz contrast is very weak. However, in the case where we form a weak transient uh, magnetization grating, the spin wave will interfere with this uh, uh, transient grating and result in a uh, changing local phase. And this changing local phase allows us to pick out the spin wave. So this data here is uh, a line profile taken in this direction here, when it's so-called a space-time contour plot, where we have um, uh, yeah, spatial coordinate on this axis and time on this axis. And this is a simulation of the expected, a very simple simulation of the expected uh, uh, contrast uh, at um, uh, when you have a transient grating and uh, 
uh, a uh, interfering with the spin wave. This has no decay into it yet, so this is still under discussion. So, um, just to conclude this part of the talk, uh, we can form by excitation of an optical transient grating, we can form a, a transient processing magnetic grating. And through studying this transient processing grating, we can determine the local magnetization and the precession frequency uh, and the dependence on the magnetic field on the uh, local precession frequency and also the EK factors. And this uh, can also be used for determining spin wave demand and dynamics. This is still unpublished results. So we will work on this in the future, I hope. And now I have a little bit of time left, but I will try to uh, uh, to um, speed up a bit. And I will talk about a study using diffraction instead of imaging, where we have studied uh, the structural dynamics and transition metal dicalcoenides, in specific the TD tungsten telluride. Uh, tungsten telluride has in it ground phase of pretty anisotropic uh, uh, crystal structure and the stacking sequence of the layers of uh, this layered materials is governed by the ridges, you can see them here, and troughs of uh, the neighboring layers. So we met the la uh, ridges are, are positioned in the vicinity of uh, the troughs in the neighboring layer. But they are not perfectly aligned, these atoms. If you see, this is a zoom in of this region where we have, just have um, the uh, tellurium atoms here are not perfectly in line. They are, there is a certain distance. So if we would look from top instead of this uh, view, we uh, can define two values, delta 1 and delta 2, that uh, determine the dis uh, sort of the disorder of this structure or not disorder, the, the, the shift in the structure. Um, so if we want to go from uh, the TD phase, uh, uh, as this is depicted, to a phase where this is straight above this atom, these atoms are aligned, we need to shift uh, 37 picometers. And this will take us from a, a, a non centrosymmetric phase to a centrosymmetric phase. So this will also result in a change in electronic topology. Um, uh, when we excite this system with um, a, a, a femtosecond laser pulse, and we collect diffraction patterns as a function of time, and they record different diffraction patterns. So this is the 1, 2, 0 spot that you see here, and this is the 1, 3, 0 spot. And we do that as a function of time. We can see an oscillation in diffraction intensities. Um, and if we uh, go to another uh, zone axis, instead looking at uh, the 0, 6, minus 4 diffraction spot, and uh, the 0, 3, 2, minus 2 diffraction spots. We still see oscillation in uh, the diffraction uh, spot intensities. And we can see that the phase of these oscillations are opposite for the 1, 2, 0 and 1, 3, 0 spots. Uh, and the uh, uh, oscillation frequency uh, is around 0.23 terahertz, which is uh, similar to the, an A1 optical phonon as recorded by Raman spectroscopy. So this uh, kind of uh, oscillation is um, a result of a relative uh, uh, dislocation or what, what relative motion of the middle layer of the unit cell uh, with respect to the upper and lower layer of the unit cell in the D direction of the, uh, as indicated in the B direction as indicated in uh, by the images here. We can uh, also prove this by uh, in, <clears throat> by doing some structure factor calculations, where we uh, simulate uh, we can simulate the diffraction response by distorting the crystal structure by sliding the atomic or the the 
um, the planes relative to each other and we can see that we can reproduce the uh, uh, the, the oscillation in the fraction intensities if we assume a um, uh, oscillation period uh, that is uh, po uh, uh, 0.23 terahertz and uh, uh, also a um, amplitude in the oscillation that is in the order of uh, 2.5 picometers. Um, so this uh, mechanism also allows us to determine that this is an uh, excitation of, uh, of, uh, of um, displacive excitation of a coherent phonon since it is best fit by a cosine function. If we um, <clears throat> um, uh, in if we excite the sample at a, a little bit higher um, um, uh, laser fluence, we will see not only excitation of a coherent phonon, but we will also see another slower process taking place. And this is reflected in uh, this dashed red uh, line that is a uh, fit of the data represented here for the 130 but also in this yellow uh, sorry about the contrast maybe a little bit weak the uh, yellow um, results from the 140 uh, diffraction spots so we can see that this is not cannot be explained by a dubai waller factor uh, behavior since we have an increase in the intensity here so uh, this is really due to a structural change taking place in the order of uh, uh, several picoseconds and maybe it's completed after around 20 picoseconds with a time constant of around uh, four to five picoseconds um, and we can see that if we follow the diffraction intensity of uh, another group of spots, the A00 um, zero spots, the 2040 spots, for instance, we, uh, we can see that we don't see this oscillation behavior and we don't also do not see this uh, slower uh, diffraction response that has a uh, four picosecond time constant. Instead, we just see uh, uh, a uh, <clears throat> Debye Waller behavior that uh, rapid heating of the lattice. Uh, so, this makes us um, <clears throat> propose that this uh, uh, deformation of the structure is uh, again along uh, the B direction of the lattice. And if we study samples that are of uh, and that are not perfectly smooth like these are the typical samples that I have shown so far they are planar samples with no as or as planar as we can get it uh, with uh, no uh, not a great density of defects and in these planar samples we see the oscillation uh, in um, in the um, uh, diffraction intensities however if we study samples that instead have uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> strained defects in it by uh, just looking at the different position on the sample uh, that we have generated you always find positions where that where the sample is not perfect and we uh, run time dynamic studies of these samples uh, of these locations we find that the uh, shear amplitude of the shear phonon the a1 optical phonon is greatly reduced so uh, there, but this slow process that we see still persists here. So we can say that there is that it's possible to decouple the uh, the uh, oscillation from this slower process uh, takes place and it's completed maybe after twenty picoseconds. Also, we studied different thickness of the uh, samples and looked at how this process. Uh, if it depends on the thickness and uh, uh, over the thickness range that we started we didn't see any uh, any significant change on in uh, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> in the uh, time constant for the uh, slower process that we uh, that we have observed so uh, we uh, can uh, say that this is not uh, a process that propagates through an uh, acoustic phonon throughout the sample it's in 
So <clears throat> if we do some fluence dependence of uh, um, of the um, excitation, we can see uh, even if we trace the intensities of uh, the one three zero spot at uh, three picosecond and compare that to the uh, intensities at thirty picosecond, we can see at the fluence <coughs> uh, a little bit below one picosecond, we see an opening uh, in, uh, between these two different lines here. Um, and this means that there is a th uh, threshold uh, in exciting the slower process. So uh, at very low fluence, you don't excite this uh, uh, transition to the metastable state that we observe with this slower uh, four picosecond time constant. And if, we, and if we go to a little bit uh, thicker sample, this is uh, the same is uh, observed, but at a little bit higher fluence, which is perhaps not so uh, uh, surprising since um, the, um, uh, the excitation density will be lower at a thicker sample. So if we look at, uh, try to determine uh, the, uh, the, <coughs> the shift in B direction uh, at the B uh, at the uh, metastable state by uh, considering several diffraction spots uh, like what is shown in this figure here we can say that the shear displacement in the metastable phase is around 8 picometer which is still quite far from the 37 picometer where the sample has completed the transition to the T star phase that is centrosymmetric so uh, I'm uh, running a little bit uh, out of time, so uh, I will skip this. I would just say that we ran some uh, temp uh, time uh, uh, dependent DFT and looked at the charge redistribution as a function of time. And we also looked at the stabilization of uh, the, uh, of the, uh, um, uh, T uh, star phase, that is the centrosymmetric phase, or actually the shift in uh, uh, of the middle layer as a function of doping. And we looked at that both in a, a fixed uh, shape configuration uh, that we can assume is happening uh, uh, in an in a ultrafast uh, regime where the lattice don't have res uh, time to respond. And we can see that this shift that we observe is uh, it can be induced by uh, hole doping. But we also observe that uh, in the time dependent DFT simulations that these uh, different deltas that we, I discussed in the beginning of the talk, uh, um, that they behave very differently in the simulation cell. So we have uh, a large degree of disorder happening during the first 250 femtoseconds that we could uh, have afford uh, to simulate during uh, <laughs> to get to get the PhD thesis in time. Um, so uh, we propose that the, uh, this uh, transition that takes place it takes place over a, a state of a high disorder, and this we could also see in the few scattering where we, at uh, around time zero, we see a sharp decrease increase in the few scattering. So if I now uh, wrap up at uh, the time roughly the time where I uh, will end. So uh, we have um, presented a description of um, uh, the structural response of uh, tungsten ditelluride following laser excitations. And then we could uh, describe both the for formation of an uh, excitation of an A1 a coherent shear phonon uh, and a transition at higher fluence to a metastable phase. These two processes seem to be decoupled since we in pre in samples with uh, pin shear phonons, um, we can also observe the uh, metastable phase transition. Uh, and we can observe a, a highly disordered state in the tungsten uh, telluride uh, octahedra on short time scale. Uh, and that hole doping can facilitate this relative shear of the middle layer with respect to the upper and lower layer in the unit cell. But this uh, shear, it saturates already at eight picometer, which is still pretty far from the, uh, the, the, the uh, T prime 
T star phase that ha that is expected at 37 picometer, which also can be formed uh, by doping. So then I would like to thank uh, the collaborators uh, of this study. So uh, Gao Long Kao, uh, Sheng Yang, Yuan Okeman at Gothenburg University, Xiao Sengji, uh, and Oscar Gronnes, who did the uh, simulations at the uh, Uppsala University. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing the results with us. And for our audience, if you are interested in the specifics of the cheetah detector Jonas used for his research, you can download the brochure by going to the handout tab on the right side of your screen. It is also available in French for our French speaking attendees. Keep in mind that ASI is always looking for new applications and new projects to collaborate on. So feel free to contact us at info at or connect with us via LinkedIn. The recorded version of this seminar will be sent to you via email. And that is it for me. Uh, so now we will open the floor to your questions. Our product expert, Eric Hoffenberg, will be joining us. So feel free to ask product related questions as well. Hi there. Hi. Okay. Um, now I've got a question here, if it would uh, make sense to use uh, a time result detector in in your experiment, uh, what, would it have any advantages? Um, I, I think from the, for the time resolution that we're aiming for, it's not uh, something that can be reached by a uh, time, the time resolution of the detector. However, uh, I think the uh, TimePix camera uh, I would have, I should have brought this slide with the time picks on, but I, uh, the time picks camera has a function that is called time over threshold, uh, which means that it can, which can be useful in uh, in diffraction experiments because it uh, can allow you to uh, discriminate if you have one or multiple uh, electrons hitting the same pixel at the same time. Because if you uh, have uh, a longer time over threshold, that means that you have deposited more charge in the pixel. Uh, uh, so you can, if I remember correctly, you can have a linear response up to 10 electrons per pixel. If I, um, yeah, so uh, uh, this this could be uh, useful in uh, I think in my experiment, especially for the normalization of the diffraction data uh, at um, uh, using the direct beam, and there one could crank up the uh, uh, the electron the number of electrons per bunch, and uh, potentially one can correct for such double counting events. Um, yeah, uh, now David uh, uh, said the, the <clears throat> dynamic range is uh, of this detector is, uh, uh, maybe I should write, uh, read the question. <laughs> uh, could you please comment on the dynamic range of the detector and the feasibility of, of for example, studying satellite peak dynamics for charge sensitive wave phases? such as in the transition metal dicarbonate you studied. Thank you. I think, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, I, I think that this detector should be uh, very good for this. It has a very high dynamic range. Uh, so um, uh, this is possible. Uh, I think if I would have had this detector, uh, I pre we previously studied uh, short sensitive wave systems that we published some time ago. And I expect that um, yeah, it would have benefited from having the Medipix detector that I have now. And we will, uh, the plan is that we will install a TimePix uh, detector, uh, but it has been uh, a little bit delayed due to the COVID <laughs> situation. 
so yes, uh, I, I think mm, yeah please if, if i may add about the dynamic range of the metapix 3 based uh, detectors uh the frames are uh up to 24 bits there are several bit depths that you can select uh, and with frame rate uh, uh, of 24 bit is up to uh, approximately a thousand frames per second. So that's a very, uh, very high number of particles per second that you can uh, distinguish. But uh, David, as I know, you're uh, also running um, uh, a UEM uh, in Minnesota. So um, if you, if it's you, <laughs> then then um, uh, of course if you have double hits in a, uh, then you would need this in the same pixel you would need this function for the time picks to the for uh, for so if this is a problem for you for your measurement then i think the time picks could be uh, good i hope so at least Let's wait a couple of minutes. If there are any more questions, feel free to ask them now. In the meantime, may I maybe uh, ask a question myself? Uh, is uh, you, you studied these samples with uh, both light and the electron pulses. Do you see any degradation of the sample after, uh, after your measurements? Uh, these samples are pretty sturdy, so they can uh, they can handle a lot of beating. Um, so uh, in this case, of course, if you uh, if you crank up the fluence a lot, then uh, you can melt any sample. Uh, but we uh, try to keep in a range where we during the duration of the experiment keep the sample intact. But of course, uh, there are other samples that are not as sturdy. So um, you could uh, foresee a lot of different samples where uh, where, time, where degradation is possible. And I know David has uh, worked on this actually with pulsed electrons. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, if we have a limit on acquisition times, do you, uh, David, uh, do you mean uh, long acquisition times or uh, or short? You can in in uh, in uh, um, imaging want. Ah, you can do uh, minutes acquisition. No, no problem. You you can uh, you can do very long acquisition times, or you can also do uh, several images uh, and add them together afterwards, right? Uh, if that was the question. So we usually um, in our experiments we run several acquisitions, and uh, actually we have uh, some. A study that uh, I didn't show any results from, uh, for where we have used diffuse scattering, and that is, of course, uh, um, even more time-consuming than looking at uh, elastic uh, peak uh, peaks. So uh, there we uh, collect data for <laughs> hours <laughs> at the at every delay. Uh, and there, I think the low noise is, of course, of uh, relevance. But uh, you don't want to add noise when you when you integrate for several hours or seven, like thirty minutes or so. Mm -hmm. yes. hmm? All right, we have um, one more right now. Yes, for Professor so. Jonas. Yeah. Uh, so it's from Vishal. Uh, so, uh, how will uh, for thin film samples second laser be helpful in measuring misalignment, which is dependent upon strain, thermal expansion coefficient, etc.? How strain effect can uh, 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 can affect the uh, misalignment? Uh, 
I think that's what you mean, right? Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, if you do time result diffraction, as uh, I would say, um, and uh, you can uh, monitor actually the propagation of strain waves in sample. This is uh, David has published several, David Flanagan has pu published several papers on that to a very high degree. So that there you can get information on how the uh, the strain is propagated over the sample as a function of time. But um, if you if you want to do something, I, I assume that you you're interested in not static imaging, because in uh, in static imaging, of course, I th think there is uh, not much uh, advantage of going to use the laser or so. But uh, here we're all already we're always interested in the, the, the dynamic processes. Um, Unless if you try to circumvent some beam damage effect by uh, by going to stroboscopic imaging, uh, I don't know if I understood the question correct. Yes. Uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, you can look at the uh, no. This is a follow-up questions. How dynamically you can visualize in order to trace defects? Uh, you can. Uh, we haven't done that. Uh, yet, or we have one paper that we tried to push out, but it's, it's not really ready yet, so we're holding on the data. But uh, you can look at where uh, acoustic phonons are, lo uh, are, are nucleated, for instance, uh, at the effects. But um, uh, and um, um, if it's nucleated at a defect site, for instance. Uh, but the structure of the defect site itself, I haven't uh, found myself, I haven't determined the structure of the defect site through other than uh, static uh, measurements, actually, if, if, if this was the question. All right, uh, well, thank you for answering the questions. I see that we're almost at the one hour mark, All right? It seems that your answer was sufficient. Um, thank you again, Jonas yep. and yep. Eric for joining us today. Uh, for the audience, we would really appreciate your feedback on today's seminar. At the end, if you stay until the end, you will be redirected to a small survey. And thank you again for joining and have a very nice day. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah.